Right, let's get started. My name's Jay. I'm one of the teachers here at E2 Language. I'm one of the PTE academic experts. What we're going to do in this live class is look at describe image, which is one of the PTE speaking tasks. And it's probably the most challenging one. Yes, it's probably the most challenging one because while you have to really just be spontaneous, you have to think on your feet, it requires spontaneous language construction, whatever that is. Let me just get started and stop waffling. Let's think about what happens in PTE speaking describe image. What happens is this. This is what you're going to see on test day. And you look at this and without a method and without proper training, this is going to be pretty tough. Because what's going to happen is you're going to have 25 seconds to prepare to speak and 40 seconds to speak. In other words, you're going to look at this for 25 seconds. Then this little microphone-y thing here is going to change and start recording. And you'll have 40 seconds to describe this image here. So let me just tell you what 25 seconds feels like. You can see the timer ticking down there. And if you have no idea what to do, if you haven't got a developed method to describe this image, well, those 25 seconds are going to be a bit terrifying. And you're going to sort of sit there and think, holy moly, what am I going to do? Three, two, one, and then beep, the microphone will beep or it will turn red or whatever it does. I'm not sure. I did do the PTE, by the way, and I got straight 90s. Um, I can't remember what the microphone did. Anyway, before we look at a method, I want to tell you how it's scored because I want you to understand this. It's critical to understand how this thing is scored so you can get a top score. PT speaking described image focuses on three things, content, pronunciation, and oral fluency. Let's think about content. Content is, well, first of all, you need to distinguish between labeling a graph and describing a graph. This is not what you want to do. This is what you want to do. You've got to describe the graph. There's a big difference. You don't want to label it. Let me tell you what I mean here. So some clever people will go into the PTE and they'll say, describe an image, that's easy. Let me show you how to do this. This is a line graph. It has a title. The title says proportion of population aged over 65, age 65 and over. This graph also has an X axis. It has one, two, three, four, five, six different years. The y-axis is in percentage from 30 down to zero. And that, my friends, is called labeling the graph. And yes, you'll do okay. You'll do okay for 45 maybe. But what you need to do is describe it. And there's something very different to describing an image rather than labeling it. I'm going to show you in a second what that means and how to describe it, by the way. Let's keep thinking about scoring. Pronunciation, what does that mean? Well, you get marked out of five, and what we want to aim for is this one here. We want native-like pronunciation. I've got to tell you, E2 language has now helped, I don't know, thousands, tens of thousands maybe, tens of thousands of people pass their academic. And without a doubt, the number one problem that people have is pronunciation. Maybe it's not your problem. Maybe it's actually the PTE computer's problem. But nevertheless, that's the way it's programmed. It seems unfair that somebody can get really high scores in everything and yet their speaking score will be down in the 50s, for example, because pronunciation and oral fluency are terrible. There's a few reasons why this happens and why it feels so unfair. One of the reasons is that the PTE is programmed with native English from Australians, Americans, Canadians, New Zealanders, and British, for example. So Filipinos, Indians, Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, wherever you're from in the world, they didn't use your English to program it. They used 
my English and, and, and Kaya's English, for example. So even if your English is really good, like you speak English at home, you speak English at work, whatever, maybe you were educated in English, if you're speaking in Indian English or Filipino English, it's tough. It's tough. One of the things that they look for is this native-like pronunciation. What does that mean? Well, let me give you an example. A lot of Indians have problems with the, dis the distinction between v and w. For example, an Indian might say something like, um, 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 it sounds to me like vibrant, when in fact, this should be a V, vibrant. So this sound here is often mispronounced. It should be v, 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 not w, w, w. So little sounds like this, the difference between v and w, is the difference between native-like pronunciation and non-native-like. So maybe if you made these sorts of mistakes, they're not mistakes, your language is fine, but that's not how the PT looks at it, you might get a good, for example, not a native-like. And you want to aim for a native like. So it's tough. One of the things you might need to do is take a consultation with us. In your tutorial, what we can do is identify the particular sounds that you're mispronouncing and guide you on how to rectify, how to change those sounds so you can sound more native like, even if you just do it for the exam. And then you keep your Indian accent or your Filipino accent outside. It doesn't matter. But this PTE demands native-like English. Uh, there's a bit of a definition that they give. That means that you are understood easily by regular English speakers. What I mean there is if you're speaking to me, who is a regular English speaker, and I have to strain to understand you, like I have to sort of think, what's she saying? Oh, 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 vibrant. Right, right, right. If I have to strain like that, strain that is awesome. I need to understand you immediately and precisely. Cool. Uh, we also have this app which might help you. It's called E2 Pronounce, and it actually corrects your pronunciations, part of your package that you buy when you sign up to us. Oral fluency, you're also scored on oral fluency. And again, you need native-like oral fluency. That means that you speak smoothly with rhythm and phrasing. You do not hesitate, repeat yourself, or restart your sentences. There's two things going on here I want to talk about. One is you speak smoothly. What does that mean? This means that you're not searching for words and you're not searching for grammar to put those words into. In other words, the phrases that you're saying, the sentences that you're saying come to you immediately. There's no sort of building these sentences in your mind before you say them. Just like in your first language, they just appear. They just appear. Words appear, sentences appear, and you can just describe and discuss and do all that sort of stuff. Now, the other thing is you have to do it with rhythm, which means that your sentences go up and down in the right places. Your words go up and down in the right places. For example, I have a friend and he says, instead of determine, he wants to determine something. He says determine, determine versus determine. Maybe that's a pronunciation issue actually. Uh, phrasing. So when you speak, you're chunking words together. You're chunking. You're not speaking like a robot. You are in fact, chunking your words together to make phrases. Here's the hesitation thing. Try not to repeat yourself or restarting sentences is also not good. Uh, you want to avoid hesitations. For example, the line chart represents the number of people that that's an example of hesitating. You don't want to do that. You need to avoid repetitions. The line, the line chart represent represents the number of the number of people that 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 play play basketball. Avoid repetitions. Avoid false starts. The line chart represents. I mean, the bar graph represents the number of people. Sorry, the number of students who play. I mean. 
I'm sorry, computer, please forgive me. The number of students who watch basketball. I mean, I'm sorry again, oh dear, who watch swimming. You should never apologize to the PTE computer, by the way. Never do that. Uh, so in summary, how you're scored on describe image is content, which means how well you describe the image, you get scored out of five. Pronunciation, how clearly you describe the image, you get scored out of five. And oral fluency, which means how smoothly you describe the image, and you get scored out of five. Cool, fine, now we've talked about that. What types of images will you see in your exam? Well, this is where it gets a little bit scary. You will see bar charts. Uh, this is a, this is the, uh, you'll see, also see the bar chart that's, that's, that's horizontal that goes up. This is the one that goes sideways. So you'll see both of those types. You'll see double bar charts. Um, they look really similar, except this one actually is showing two things here. You can see the green one and the and the brown one here. So you'll see double bar charts. You'll see two bar charts, for example. Uh, you might see a bar chart that looks like this, which, by the way, I have no idea what it's called. But here, there's there's different wildlife, volcanoes, storms, landslides. And they're all included inside this, this, this bar here. If anyone knows what they're called, please put that into the chat below. I'd like to know. Line charts. Uh, where's my mouse going? Line charts that look like this. Pie charts. That's probably the easiest one to look at. Double pie charts. Multiple graphs, so here we have a table and a bar chart. Uh, you might see a diagram or a process. Uh, table or tables, plural. Uh, you might even see a map. Now, there's also, I don't know if you ever see images like a photograph, but maybe that's possible. Maybe that's possible, I'm not sure. But anyway, all of those ones I just showed you are what you possibly will see on test day, because on test day, you'll get five or six of these images to describe, not just one, five or six in a row. One bar graph, one line chart, it'll be mixed up like that. All right, we need a method. We need a method that cuts through, makes our job easier on test day. We need to work out how to do this step by step in a process. So. We're going to have a three-step method. We're going to have an introductory sentence. We're gonna have an image description and a concluding sentence. These are the three parts. The three parts will go for about this long. So your introductory sentence will go for about five seconds. Then you'll describe the image for about 25 seconds. Then you'll conclude in a sen single sentence, which will take you about five seconds. So all up here, we're aiming for about 35 seconds, okay? I said before that this task is for 40 seconds. You have from zero to 40 seconds to describe the image, but aiming for 35 seconds is probably best. Because one of the things you don't want to do is go all the way to 40 seconds. You don't want to keep speaking at 40 seconds because the microphone will just stop. And if you're midway through a sentence, it will just cut you off. One of the things you can do and what I did in my PT is I just click next. So I described the image for 35 seconds. I introduced it, described it, concluding sentence. It got to about 35 seconds and I just click next went to the next image, introduced, described, concluded, next, introduced, described, concluded. Take it to 35 seconds, it's a good number. If you go more or slightly more or slightly less, that's fine. By the way, I'll, an I'll answer questions at the end if you have questions. Let's think about the introduction, how to introduce this image. This is the one that goes for about five seconds. It's a single sentence, maybe two sentences, usually one sentence. Right, what we want to do when we first look at this is this. We wanna say this bar graph represents the title plus the X axis. So something like this bar chart represents the reason why people think crime occurs according to various influences, including TV, 
personal experience, radio, and others. Let me map this out for you. Now, one of the things you'll notice, this is the title, so we want to start here. This bar graph represents number one, uh, why people think crime is blah, 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 blah. Then I'm just sort of, I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, what the hell is the x-axis in this? I need to go back, actually. I need to go back. This is tricky. The reason why people think crime occurs. Okay, this is a little bit different. I've just, do, 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 this bar graph represents. Sorry, I made a mistake. This is what we do. We say, we start with this. First of all, we identify that it's a bar graph and we say this is number one, actually. This bar graph represents number two, got myself mixed up there, the title. Then we move to number three, which is the X axis, which is here, in fact, which looks like a Y axis because it's on the side. So we go one, this bar graph represents the reasons why people think crime occurs according to various influences, including TV, newspapers, and radio. So I want you to do this. Let me do it again. This actually, let's do it really basically. For the first one, I just want you to repeat after me. I know that sounds sort of uh, 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 um, patronizing. I don't want it to be patronizing. I just want you to follow me. Let's do this together. This bar graph represents the reasons why people think crime occurs according to various media outlets, including TV, newspapers, and radio. Cool. Now you try. In three, two, one, introduce this graph, please. Cool. One of the things that you would have noticed is that the title, you can't just read that title because this bar graph represents why do people think there is more crime? No, you can't do that. So oftentimes in PT Describe Image, you have to rearrange the title so it makes grammatical sense. So instead of saying, this bar graph represents why do people think there is more crime, which doesn't make sense. You'll say, this bar graph represents the reason why people think there is more crime. Then you move to the x-axis here, and you have to, of course, you wouldn't just read all of these. You wouldn't say including TV, from what I read in newspapers, experience of people like personal experiences, you would choose maybe three, including TV, newspapers, and radio. Right, let's do it again, and this one hopefully will be a little bit easier. So what I want to do is introduce this graph in a single sentence, saying this bar chart represents the title and the x-axis. Fine, I'm going to say something like this bar chart represents how many millions of hectares of forest existed from before the 1700s to 2010, according to two types of forest, tropical and temperate. Let me try to do this again without looking freestyle. So I'm going to introduce this. Now, there's no real title, but I'm going to sort of make one up here. Sorry, Let's, this, this is number one. And then I'm going to go up here and sort of make up a title. Then I'm going to go down here to the real x axis and I'm going to go from here to here. So this bar graph represents how many million hectares of forest were deforested, including tropical and temperate, from pre 1700 to 2010. I'm going to do it again. This bar graph represents how many millions of hectares were lost, including tropical and temperate, from before the 1700s to 2010. I'm going to do it again. 
This bar chart represents the number of millions of hectares that were lost to deforestation from before the 1700s to 2010, including tropical forests and temperate forests. You can see that there's a method, but there's also flexibility. I just did it three different ways. When you practice, you should just try and be flexible. Let the sentence sentences formulate, let them come as they are, but do follow that three-step pattern. Your turn. Please introduce this graph in three, two, one, start. Good. You should have said the type of graph. You should have mentioned this. You should have mentioned the x-axis and you should have mentioned both of these. Now, you'll notice that I haven't really been getting into the y-axis yet. And to be quite honest, I'm probably not going to spend much time in the y-axis because it's extremely confusing. But we'll get to that when we start to describe the image. Let's continue to introduce graphs. This one here has two bar charts. Okay, there's no title or is there a title? Because if you look closely, you can see percentage of rural population using solid fuels. Okay, again, it's got these two different, it's a double bar graph, the poorest quintile and the richest quintile. What's a quintile? I have no idea, but it doesn't matter because what I'm going to do on test day is just describe whatever I see. Even if I don't really understand it, I'm going to kind of fake it, okay? Cool. And then what have we got here? Well, we've got names of countries, Bangladesh, Brazil, China, Ethiopia, etc. So let me describe this without reading it. Here we go. These bar charts represent, here, here we go, these bar charts represent the percentage of rural population using solid fuels across various countries, including Bangladesh, Brazil, and China, including the poorest and the richest quintile. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to say these bar charts represent the percentage of the population living in rural areas who use solid fuels across various countries, including Bangladesh, China, and India, in the poorest and the richest quintile. Let's have a look at what I actually wrote. What you will notice is that because we had two charts, I don't say this chart represents, I say these charts represent. So our grammar must change a little bit the title and the x-axis. So I said these bar charts represent the percentage of the population using solid fuels. That time I took the title almost word for word because I could, because it was grammatical, in the richest and poorest quintile across various countries, including Bangladesh, Brazil, China, Ethiopia, and more. Your turn. Please introduce this graph in three, two, one, start. Cool. Let me just see that people are alive and well in the chat here. <laughs> um, by the way, if you're in this webinar and, this, and the screen's not formatting well for you, go to YouTube, go to our PTE channel. This is streaming live on YouTube and it will fit on your screen. If you're having problems viewing this, please view it on YouTube. If you're on YouTube, by the way, please click like, leave a comment and uh, make this video number one. That would be great. Okay, cool. All right. Someone says that a quintile is 100 kilograms. There you go. You learn something every day. Um, so you'll have to find, just type in E2PTE into YouTube. Cool. Let's keep going. I'm going to keep introducing these graphs. We've got another bar chart here, and we're going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to say, this bar chart represents the absolute number of annual global deaths from natural disasters by decade, including natural catastrophes like wildfire, volcanic activity and storms from 1900 to 2015. Cool, systematic, there we go. I said this bar chart represents the title and then I actually went here and here, fine. Uh, this bar chart represents the title and the x-axis. 
your turn in three do, uh, introduce this graph in three two one start I don't know if you can see that by the way let me just tell you this is this is 1900 and this is 2015 there's your x-axis so this bar chart represents the absolute number of annual global deaths from natural disasters including wildfire volcano storms and landslides from 1900 to 2015 that's our introduction it's perfect let's keep going line chart here we go so what do I do? I say this line chart because it's a line chart. So this is number one. Then I go to number two, the title, and then I go to the x-axis here, number three. So I say this line chart represents the price of crude oil in dollars per barrel from 1861 to 2015. That you could you could hear a little bit of hesitation in my voice then. So the PT algorithm's probably gone, whoop, not very good because I was hesitant, looking for those words, trying to formulate my sentences. Let me try again. This line chart represents crude oil prices measured in US dollars per barrel from 1861 to 2015. Better, better oral fluency. The words flowed more smoothly. My pronunciation was crisp. And my content score was good because I just did describe or introduce that graph very well. This line graph represents the title plus the x-axis. Your turn in three, two, one, go. Cool. What you may have done is you may have just gone straight to this because it's a part of the title. That's fine. You could have said this line chart represents crude oil prices from 1861 to 2015. There's a little subtitle here in US dollars per barrel. So you could include that extra little bit of information. Fine. Here's another line chart. It's exactly the same except it's filled up. So let's do this one. So I'm going to do this line chart. It's a line chart title and then i'm going to do x-axis here this line graph or line chart let me start again this line chart represents the number of international tourists who arrive by world region from the years 1950 to 2016 so i sort of move this around a little bit please introduce this graph in three two one start Cool, good, let's do a pie chart. Again, this pie chart represents the title. So I'm gonna do pie chart represents title. There's no x-axis. However, there are a number of countries here. So I'll use this as my x-axis. This will be number three down here. So I'm gonna say this pie chart represents how much money countries spent on their military in billions of dollars in 2013, including countries such as Germany, India, Japan, and France. Whoa, what happened here? Well, I've got this crazy title and I couldn't make it work grammatically. So I had to move it all around. I said, this pie chart represents how much money countries spent on their military. I did not say this pie chart represents countries by military expenditures. Why? Because it just sounds a little bit weird. It's probably not quite grammatical. So I just, in that moment, I, I move that stuff around. How much money countries spent on their military in billions of dollars in 2014, including Germany, India, Japan, and France. Your turn. To introduce this pie chart in three, two, one one start good 
note, so this pie chart represents the title plus the x-axis. This pie chart represents various countries' military expenditures in billions of dollars in 2014, including the USA, Germany, India, and others. Again, I could have read every country here, but no. If you want to get a top score, just use three examples only, okay? Fine. Good. Double pie charts. Wow. To be perfectly honest, this one doesn't have a title, so I have no idea how to do this. In the real PTE, all of the charts will have titles or something to tell you what this is about. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons why you should be careful of using some of the practice material you find on YouTube is that it's misleading. And if anything, it will do more damage than good. Uh, creating PTE materials is a bit of an art form. It's not easy. We've got a team here of expert linguists who actually really know how to deconstruct and rewrite tests. So the material that you use is actually spot on. It's the same or very similar to what you will experience on test day. I've seen a number of YouTube videos that just make me shudder because it's just totally off the mark. Reorder paragraphs, holy moly. Some of them just don't even have answers. Anyway, enough of that. This one is one of those examples. We can't do it with this one. But what we must remember as we're talking about these pie charts represent. So we change that grammatically a little bit. The title plus the x-axis. Fine. And this mixed graphs. Well, what do you do here? Okay. The same principle applies. We've got a table and we've got a bar chart here. Now, this doesn't have any title, but I can see it's about visas. So I'm going to say something like, these graph, these graph, there we go. I've just failed the PT, everybody. My grammar score just plummeted. These graph, oof, <laughs> happens to the best of us. What you need to do when you make mistakes like that is just push on. <laughs> really, they actually, I've looked at the scorecard. This is for IELTS and PTE. You are allowed to make minor grammatical mistakes. It's actually fine. They don't expect you to be perfect because if you listen to native English speakers speak, in fact, they make a lot of grammatical mistakes and they'll often say this graph represent, for example, which I just did. Anyway, let's try that again. These graphs represent how many visas were issued according to various countries across various time spans for skilled regional and skilled independent visas. Okay, you're going to notice something else that I did there. It doesn't mention anywhere about countries, but you know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to restart or apologize to the computer. I've made a boo-boo. I've made a mistake. I'm just going to push on. I'm just going to say these graphs represent the visas issued by independent and regional visas, including the totals, as well as the invitations issued from 2012 to 2013. In other words, I'm just sort of trying to do my best. That's the best that you can do. This is a tricky one. Whoopsie, what's going on here? All right, let's keep going because we've got a few more to introduce before we get to the, the description. Diagrams, here we go. So what does this diagram represent? Well, it's the same method. This diagram represents hydro <laughs> how hydroelectric power is generated right from the head gate and intake right through to the generator and turbine. I'm going to do it again. This diagram represents how hydroelectric power is generated, including the head gate, electricity, and turbine. I'm going to do it again. This diagram represents how hydroelectric power is generated right from the beginning to the end, including the generator and turbine. Fine. This is how you practice for this, by the way. Your turn. Describe this diagram in three, two, one, start. Cool, no problem. Tables. 
These tables represent various currencies that have high failure rates for purchases, including South Africa, Colombia, and Switzerland. I'm going to do it again. These tables represent various currencies that have problems when buying something online and failure rates, including South Africa, Colombia, and Switzerland. I'm going to do it again. These two tables represent currencies with high online failure rates for purchases, as well as total ratios for purchases in popular currencies, including countries such as South Africa, Colombia, and the European Union. Cool, your turn. Introduce these tables in three, two, one, start. Cool. This table or these tables represent? You choose. Fine, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, fine, fine, fine. Maps. Here we go. Right. What should you do with maps? Because maybe your geography's not that good. Maybe you don't know which country's which. And that's fine. Because if you don't know countries, you can use north, east, south, and west. Just say northern countries, or sorry, northern countries, eastern countries, southern countries, western countries. If you get it wrong, if you get the countries wrong, it doesn't matter too much. What's worse is if you stop, hesitate, restart, and uh, uh, apologize to the computer, which you should never do. Let's try this. So I'm going to look at this map. I can see, okay, it's a whole world there, all the countries, pinks and purples, PISA scores, education test scores by the OECD 2012. I can see a range of test scores down the bottom from 300 to 700. So I'm going to introduce this map by saying, this map represents the PISA scores, including education test scores in the OECD in 2012 from 300 to 700. I'm going to do it again. This map represents the PISA scores, the education test scores in the OECD in 2012 from 300 to 700, including countries that have no data. Cool. Your turn. Please introduce this map. You want to go one, you want to go two, and you want to go three. In three, two, one, start. Good, good, good. Right, right, right. We know how to do that. Okay, okay. We've just learned how to introduce any image you see on test day, including maps, tables, diagrams, double bar charts, double pie charts, the whole kit and caboodle. Fantastic. That was step one. Now we're on to step two where we need to describe the image. And this is where it gets, well... This is where it's it's less formulaic. It's not just duh, duh, duh. Introduction's quite easy. Now it's up to you to use your language skills to describe what's happening with that data over time. I'm just going to sort of show you what I would do. This one's going to go for about 25 seconds. So I'm going to get my stopwatch out. And if you have a phone, please get your stopwatch out so you can see how long you're speaking for. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce, then I'm going to speak for about 25 seconds on this. Now, I haven't done this before. That's why I'm sort of making many mistakes, by the way. But why not? Let's just do it. So my introduction is going to be like this. I know that I've got to introduce this bar graph represents the title plus the x-axis. Fine. Then I'm going to spend 25 seconds talking about TV, newspapers, radio, internet, and blah, blah, blah. Here we go. So I press start now. This bar chart represents the reasons why people think there is so much crime in the world according to various media sources such as TV, radio, and the internet. TV is the most commonly sought of thing that 
people think there is in the world. Second, there is newspapers which account for up to 48% of the reason why people think there is much crime. Personal experience comes in at just 20%, followed by radio, and the internet accounts for only 3%. That was terrible. That was absolutely terrible. I need to practice my describe image. Let's do it again. I'm going to do it one more time. Right, here we go. This bar chart represents the reasons why people think there is so much crime, including TV, radio, and internet, amongst other things that influence people. TV accounts for 57% of the reasons why people think there is much crime. Radio, by contrast, comes in at just 15%, while the internet explains only 3% of the reasons why people think there is much crime. Okay, that was better. That was better. Now, did I describe everything in that x-axis? No, I only chose three things. I talked about TV, radio, and the internet. Why? Because they were just the first things that came into my mind. So it's actually impossible to describe all of those different, uh, I don't know what they are, media, influences. I'm trying to think of some sort of category for them. And that's probably why I'm struggling a little bit. No problem. Your turn. I want you to introduce and then describe this graph in three, two, one, start. And stop. Cool. How did you go? You should have introduced it with that single sentence. This bar graph represents title x-axis. Then describe some of the key features for 25 seconds. Right. We need to stop and think for a second because we've kind of missed an important step, which is that we actually get 25 seconds to prepare to speak. What should we do in that 25 seconds? Well, me, I would run through the introduction. This bar chart represents the reasons why people think there is so much crime, including various media outlets such as TV, radio, and the internet. Okay, fine. So I've got my, 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 my introduction worked out. That's no problem. I do one, two, three for my introduction. But what I really want to spend my time doing in the 25 seconds is looking at this data and thinking, okay, more than that though, what I want to do is I want to come up with a sentence type that will make it easy, a sentence that I can just repeat. What about TV accounts for? That's a nice way to do this. Let's try that. TV accounts for 57% of the reasons why people think there is so much crime. Newspapers, by contrast, are about 10% less. Radio, surprisingly, is only 15%. And the internet accounts for just 3% of the reasons why people think there is so much crime. Accounts for, that's a nice way to do it. TV accounts for about 57%. Try that again. Just describe this graph for 20 seconds using accounts for. TV accounts for 57%. Three, two, one, start. Cool. All right. The other thing that I did was this. I said, I said, okay, so TV accounts, accounts for 57% of the reason why people think there is so much crime. Then I did radio by contrast. Radio by contrast only accounts for 15%. So I've sort of control our statistics here. Let's keep pushing on because that's just the first one. What about double bar charts? Well, 
This bar chart represents how many million hectares of forest, including tropical and temperate, were harvested from the pre-1700s to 2010. In the pre-1700s, temperate rainforest accounted for 400 million hectares of deforestation. This number decreased dramatically until 1995, until it almost completely disappeared. Tropical rainforest, by contrast, has fluctuated from the pre-1700s, where it was quite high in 1950, down to 2010, where it accounted for just 100 million hectares. I've probably spoken for way too long. But you can see what I did. I introduced the graph fine. Then I started just with temperate rainforest, temperate forest. And I said there's been a, what did I say, a dramatic decline over the period from the 1700s to 1995. Then for tropical forest, I said it's fluctuated throughout the period. And I said it reached a peak in 1979 or 1950 rather, something like that. So really what I've done is two things. I've, I've described a trend here. And then here I've described a trend saying it fluctuated. And then I've described a particular data point. Why did I do that? Well, it was just the first thing that came to my head while I was looking at it. I didn't give myself the 25 seconds preparation time. I'm going to give you 25 seconds to prepare. And then I want you to introduce and describe the key features of the graph. Here we go. Your 25 seconds preparation time starts now. Describe, introduce the graph rather in three, two, one, start. And describe the key features. And stop, that's 30 seconds. So you should have introduced and then described this graph. Cool, let's push on, let's do this one here. So let's look at it for 25 seconds. I'm just gonna, in my mind, I'm gonna say these bar charts represent the percentage of the rural population using solid fuels, according to poorest and richest quintiles in countries such as Bangladesh, Brazil, Egypt, and Ethiopia, fine. Okay. What can I see here? I can see that there are two charts, but I can't really make out why they're different. Why are there two charts? Okay, I'm just going to make it up. I'm going to say in the first chart, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and India used the most amount of solid fuels. In the second chart, Bangladesh, Ethiopia, and India, as well as China, used the most amount of solid fuels, something like that. I just have to quickly make a decision like this, what I'm gonna describe. And oftentimes what's easiest is just to do the biggest or the smallest. Okay, so let me try this, here we go. These bar charts represent the percentage of the rural population that use solid fuels in the poorest and richest quintiles in various countries, including Bangladesh, Brazil, China and others. Ethiopia is the same amount or almost exactly the same amount depending on both the poorest and the richest quintiles. In the second chart, the richest quintile is far less in Ethiopia. In India, in the second chart, the richest quintile is almost non-existent, whereas the poorest quintile is quite high at around 90. What am I talking about? I have no idea. You try. <laughs> this is tough. This is tough. Here we go. 25 seconds to prepare. Then I want you to introduce and describe these graphs. So your 25 seconds starts now.
I want you to introduce and describe the graphs in three, two, one, start. And that's 30 seconds. Good work. So hopefully you introduced and described the chart. Hopefully you didn't hesitate too much. Hopefully you didn't um and ah. Like a mm, ah, it's ah, uh, none of those types of noises. Even if you're really confused about what you were describing, as long as you stayed calm and just made sure that you're pronouncing your sentence, your words properly and that your sentences were formulated correctly. Let's do some easier ones because these, I think I've made them too hard for you. Let's do this one. This one looks a bit easier. Okay, let's, I'll go first and then I want you to do it. So introduce the line graph represents crude oil prices in US dollars per barrel from 1861 to 2015. Fine, I've got the introduction. Now I need to look at this. I need to say crude oil prices were highest around 1961, 1980, and again in 2015. The lowest price of crude was in about 1870, okay, 18, 1945, and again in about the mid 1960s. Okay, great, I've got my description, here we go. This line chart represents crude oil prices in US dollars per barrel from 1861 to 1880. The highest price of crude occurred in 1861, 1980, and around 2015. The lowest price of crude was in about the mid 1850s. I've just made a mistake, but I'll keep going. Early 1940s and around 1965. Cool. That was fine. You heard me make a mistake about the accuracy of what I was saying about the graph, but I, I I'll just keep going. I'll just keep going. I made a blunder. I just push on. Cool. Your turn. Please look at this graph for 25. You probably don't need to. Let's just do it. Please introduce and describe this graph in three, two, one, start. And that's 30 seconds. How did you go? Um, by the way, if you're on YouTube, please click like if you're liking and learning from this lesson. Right, and we'll miss that one. Let's do this one. This one's a bit tricky because it's got that tricky title. Let me go first. Okay, so I'm going to do this pie chart represents the title and then the x-axis. I'm just going to list three countries for example. Okay, what can I see though in this graph? USA accounts for almost half of military expenditure at almost $600 billion. The next biggest is China followed by Saudi Arabia. The lowest is Germany and India. Okay, great, I've got my key features. Here we go. This pie chart represents how much money countries spend on their military, military in in billions of dollars in 2014, including countries such as Germany, India, and Japan. The USA spends the most amount of money on its military at nearly $600 billion. This is followed by China and then closely followed by Saudi Arabia. Germany, India, and Japan spend the least on their military at around $45 billion each. Cool, your turn. Introduce and describe the graph in three two, one, start.
Okie dokie. Cool. How did you go? Let's skip on and do some other ones. Okay, let's try the diagram. With this one, it's a process. It's a diagram. So we need to talk about first this happens, then this happens, followed by this, and finally this happens. Now, I actually don't think this is a great diagram to do this with, but nevertheless, let's just try. Let's just practice. This diagram represents how hydroelectric power is generated, showing right from the head gate right through to the generator and the turbine. First of all, water is taken in through the intake and the trash rack, which then flows along the central cavity into the transformer and generator. This spins to create a turbine, which then powers electricity. I have no idea if that's true, by the way. But anyway, your turn. Let's just do it. Three, two, one, start. Okay, that's 30 seconds and that's all good. Fine. Tables. Okay, let's do this one. Why not? I'll go first. Oh, deep breath. These tables represent various currencies that have high failure rates for purchases in various countries, including South Africa, Colombia, and Switzerland. South Africa has the highest rates of failure purchases with a decline rate of 73, closely followed by Colombia and then Switzerland. Denmark, Guatemala and Peru have the lowest rates of failure for purchases. Okay, I just described the left table, but that's all I could sort of manage. Your turn in three, two, one, start. And stop. Cool. Fine. Let's push on. Here we go. Maps. Okay. No problem. Let's do a map. I'm going to time myself this time because I feel like I've been going too short. Here we go. Three, two, one. I'll start. This map represents PISA scores, including education test scores in the OECD in the year 2012, in maths, reading, and science, with the scores varying between 300 and 700. Russia and Northern America, including Canada as well as China, have the highest PISA scores. South America, Indonesia, and some countries in Central Asia have the lowest scores at around 350. Was what I said accurate? Well, not really. I probably got some of those countries wrong, but does that really matter? Not really. The most important thing is that I just kept talking, didn't correct myself, didn't um and ah, and didn't hesitate. Don't worry if you get that wrong. Let's do this one. You do it in three, two, one, start. And stop, that's 30 seconds, cool. All right, we're now up to the conclusion. We've learned how to introduce, we've learned how to describe, but I guess there's no real method for the description. The description really is about finding a key subject and then formulating a sentence that'll work for all of those 
uh, following sentences. The description requires practice. It absolutely requires practice. You can see that even me as a native English speaker and English language teacher and PTE expert, I haven't studied these graphs. I'm just doing it as we're sitting here now. I mean, I made the presentation, but you can see that even I'm struggling to describe this without falling into umming and ahhing and hesitating. It's tough. I should have practiced before I did this to make less of a fool of myself. But anyway, at least you know how hard this actually is. Let's focus on the conclusion. The conclusion is a bit more straightforward. The conclusion or the concluding sentence should go for about five seconds. So now we're up to, after we've done the introductory sentence and the image description, we're up to 30 seconds. So we've got about five, we've actually got 10 seconds left, but let's just use five seconds to say one sentence that starts with the word overall. Why? Because we want to trigger the computer to know that we're concluding, because according to the score guide, if you conclude, you get a top mark. Uh, so this is how we let the computer know that we're concluding. We say overall, then we move on to the main trend, overall main trend, or overall one or two main points, the end. So let's do this now. So I'm going to run through the whole thing from beginning to end. I'm going to time myself. I'm going to put it on 40 seconds, and away we go. This bar graph represents various reasons why people think there is more crime in the world including TV, newspapers, and radio. Overall, uh, TV accounts for almost 57% of the reasons why people think there is a lot of crime. Newspapers follow second at 48%, followed by personal experiences of individuals. More police on the streets and the fact that people don't know account for just 1%. Overall, we can see that media such as TV, newspapers, and radio is most influential. And stop at 37 seconds. Your turn. Here we go. We're going to do the whole thing beginning to end in three, two, one, start. Three, two, one, and stop. That's 40 seconds. So when I started to say three, you're at 37 seconds. How did you go? It's a good method. It's a good method. It's not anything to, me like, you're not memorizing this. You can't memorize it. You're memorizing a structure and a process but to actually fill it with content to describe that image well requires language skills like vocabulary and grammar. If you don't have the vocab and the grammar, if you can't create sentences spontaneously and easily, it's going to be hard. There's really, this is a language test. But anyway, the method's good because it gives you something to hold on to. And I do this systematically. Here we go. In three, two, one. This bar chart represents how much forest has been deforested, including tropical and temperate, from the pre-1700s to 2010. Temperate rainforest has followed a steep decline from the pre-1700s right through to 1979 before it almost entirely vanished in 1995. Tropical rainforest fluctuated throughout the period with the most amount of deforestation occurring in 1950 at about 300. Overall, we can see that there is far more tropical rainforest than temperate rainforest. I forgot to time myself, by the way. Your turn. Three, two, one, start.
Three, two, one, and stop. That's 40 seconds. Cool. Let's not do this one because it's so crazily difficult. Let's skip it. And let's skip that one because it's too small. Let's do this one. Okie dokie. I'm going to go first. In three, two, one. This line chart represents crude oil prices in US dollars per barrel from the year 1861 to 2015. In 1861, crude oil prices were the highest at about $120 per barrel. This decreased significantly all the way through to the mid 1960s before it reached another peak in 1980 at about $110 per barrel. This decreased before increasing again until 2015, where it reached a final peak. Overall, prices have fluctuated over the period of time. Fine, that was 38 seconds. Your turn in three, two, one, start. Three, two, one, and stop. Cool, let's do another one. Let's do this one here. Here we go, I'll go first. This pie chart represents how much money countries spend on their military in billions of dollars in 2014. The USA spends far more than any other country at nearly $600 billion. This is followed by China and Saudi Arabia, and the countries that spend the least are countries such as Germany, India, and Japan at around $45 billion each. The United Kingdom spends about $61 billion. Overall, we can see that the USA far exceeds any other country on military expenditure. Cool. Now, here's a little trick. While I was doing that, you might have noticed that I included the United Kingdom. Why? Because I'm looking at my phone. I'm looking at the timer. And in the PT, you should be looking at the timer. Because I'd finished my description at about 26 seconds, which is not enough. Because if I finish my description at 26, add my single sentence conclusion, I'm only going to get to about 32 seconds or something like that. So I quickly thought to myself, I've got time to describe one more country. And so what I quickly did is, I don't know why, but this one stuck out and I said the United Kingdom spends $61.8 billion. Then I was 30 seconds. Then I knew I could go to my conclusion. And then I said, overall, we can see that the USA far, or far outspends all the other countries on military expenditure. Cool. So do keep that in mind. It's very helpful to look at the clock while you do this. Your turn in three, two, one, start. Three, two, one, and stop. Cool. I think you're starting to get the hang of it. This is good. This is good. Let's do a couple more, right? Double pie charts. We'll skip that. We'll skip that. Um, I'm going to skip this just because the diagram, it's not a good diagram. It's. I think you'll find in the PT they're easier than this. This one's tough. Let's do this one. This one's okay. Okay, I'm going to go first. This table represents various countries who have low online failure rates for purchases, as well as how popular they are in other 
currencies. South Africa is at the top of the list with a decline rate of 73, closely followed by Colombia and then Switzerland. Peru, Guatemala and Denmark rank among the lowest countries for failure rates for online purchases. In the other table, the European Union ranks as the highest. Overall, we can see that most failure rates for online purchases occur in South Africa as well as Colombia. Your turn in three, two, one, start. Three, two, one, and stop. That's 40 seconds. What else have we got? The last one. Last one. Here we go. Maps. Fine. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to say things that are inaccurate, but it doesn't matter. I'm just going to stay calm. I'm going to concentrate on my pronunciation and my oral fluency, and I'm just going to speak up to 35 seconds using the method. Here we go. This map represents the PISA scores and education test scores in the OECD in 2012 for mathematics, reading and science with the scores varying from 300 to 700. As we can see, there is no data for countries such as Australia, Western Papua, India and other countries. Countries that scored the highest on these tests included China as well as Canada and some parts of Western Europe. Overall, we can see that test scores were quite low and ranged between the scores of 350 to 450 overall. Your turn in three, two, one, start. Three, two, one, and stop. Cool. Let's recap what we learned. So we learned about scoring. We learned about scoring. We learned that content is important. This means how well you describe the image. This, by the way, includes your grammar and your vocabulary. And it also means did you describe the key features? Really, this is about those key features using correct grammar and vocabulary, right? Pronunciation is about how clearly you describe the image, how easily you would be understood by me, for example. Oral fluency, how smoothly, how uh, this is about not hesitating, not umming and ahhing, not restarting sentences, not correcting yourself, and certainly not apologizing to the computer. You kind of have to fake it, right? The method is this. There is three parts. We want to introduce the graph we want to describe the image, sorry, introduce the image, describe the image, and then conclude in a single sentence. The introduction should be five seconds, describe the image for about 25 seconds, and conclude in a single sentence. This should take you up to around 35 seconds total. And you can stop here, and then you can click the next button to move on to the next one. The introduction is a sentence of five seconds that says, this type of graph represents, for example, this bar chart, this, this map, whatever it is, represents the title plus the x-axis. We also learned that you have to be quite flexible because if you're going to read the title, sometimes you have to rearrange it to make it grammatically possible to use that title. 
We also learned that the x-axis can be like this or like this, or it can be the name of countries. Requires practice. It absolutely requires practice. Second part of the method is when you describe the image, and this goes for 25 seconds. You want to speak up to 30 seconds after your introduction. The key to this one is to choose the sentence in the preparation time. You have 25 seconds to prepare to speak, in which case you should quickly run through the introduction, but then you should really be thinking about choosing how you're going to formulate your sentences. I think the best way to think about this is if we think about our sentences as subject, verb, object, what's going to be the subject of your sentence? Is it going to be 47% of people watch TV every night? Or is it going to be people watch TV every night? No you have to decide in that time and you need to think quickly and spontaneously. Finally, you want to conclude in about five seconds where you just say overall the main trend or overall and then maybe a couple of main points or maybe one. This should take you up to 35 seconds and my friends, smiley face. That is how you do describe image. Just before we finish and go to Q&A, I want to talk to you about a little concept that I've been thinking about with language tests and learning languages and uh, how you can succeed in your test. And I, I think about it like this. This is a very popular phrase. People talk about fake it until you make it fake it until you make it, which means that you're probably not that good and you'll just try your best, which is okay. This is a phrase that I prefer. It's called learn it until you earn it. Learn it until you earn it. This one will make you a bit afraid on test day. If you really do practice and you learn those fundamental skills, you'll go into that test feeling good. You'll go in feeling much better. You can fake it until you make it and you might get the score you need, or you can actually do the hard work, build your vocabulary, improve your grammar and focus on your pronunciation so that you can nail the PTE. If you need help, do check out the website, which is www.e2language.com. If you need help with your PT, check us out. By the way, if you're on YouTube, please click like and leave a lovely comment. I'd much appreciate that. Um, that's all. Let's go to Q&A. Any questions you have? Any questions? Any questions? Uh-oh. We've got a few questions. We've got lots, actually. Yeah, okay, let's not talk about reading. Min, in, if the, in the pie chart it is mentioned that others have the lowest percentage, then should we say, for example, the coal produces highest energy and other sources produce? Yes, okay, yes. For key features, keep it simple. Keep it as simple as possible. Just do the highest points and the lowest points. There's no rewards for being complex with your graph description. So if you're looking at a bar chart and there's some really high ones and there's some really low ones, just describe the highest and then the lowest and that's it for 25 seconds. Don't talk about, you know, complex relationships and data. F no, just keep it simple. Shug says, I'm hesitating a lot. How can I stop hesitating? What are some tips for improving? Okay, why are you hesitating? Two reasons. One, you don't have the vocabulary at your disposal. Two, you don't have the sentence structure to put the vocabulary in at your disposal. In other words, you need to build your fundamental skills. You also need to practice this task because you just saw me stuff up quite a few of these, struggle with quite a few of them and not you know, definitely not perfect. Uh, I could do with some practice with this. It definitely requires practice. Okay, so Ash is getting low scores on pronunciation every time, how to improve. Right, so as I talked about, if you're an Indian English speaker, then you're going to have to make a conscious mm, effort to change the way you speak 
or say particular sounds because they're non-native like. Now, it doesn't mean that Australian English is better than Indian English or anything like that, but it means that the PT has been programmed with native English. So you need to be conscious of the words that you're not mispronouncing, the words that you're pronouncing that are non-native like. That's where you probably need an expert to sort of say, hey, go take a tutorial with one of our teachers, for example, and they'll point out particular sounds that you're making mistakes with and tell you how to improve it. Bal, is it mandatory to give a conclusion at the end? Please suggest how to give a conclusion for process diagram. Okay, fine. Uh, it's not mandatory, but if you want to get a top score, yes. It says in the score guide that a conclusion is part of it. So that's why we put in that single sentence that says overall, blah, blah, blah. For the process, you would say, overall, this process shows us how to make hydroelectricity. Overall, this process shows how to separate diamonds from mud, etc. cetera. Um, I'm stuck with only one to two points in my previous speaking test. Four times, what should I do? Sign up to one of our packages. Oh, my God. <clears throat> I spoke to a person yesterday who had failed the PT 15 times. 15 times. What's 15 times $300? Uh, 30, 55. My maths is terrible. A lot of money. If you take a good preparation course, you can save yourself not just a lot of money and a lot of time, but a lot of full energy. This person was going a bit crazy on that. Seriously, 15 is not the most, by the way. The record is 18. 18 is the highest. Uh, this was a, a guy who decided that he was going to do it himself. He was going to pass this PT by himself. He failed it 15, I think it was 15 times by himself. Then he came to us and then he failed another three times before passing. But you can see how we, you know, we didn't help him pass on the first time because he needed significant help and improvement of pronunciation. But after three times, instead of 15 times. That's the difference. It's crazy. Usha, yes, four and a half grand, says Balasan. <laughs> Thanks. My maths is absolutely appalling. Uh, okay, I'm just looking at these questions. Uh, oh, my God, everyone's still here. I thought you'd all be gone now. Um, yes, E2 Pronounce. If you're a paid member, do use the software. Use E2 Pronounce to refine particular sounds that you're having trouble with. Um, Son asks, how can I consult with an E2 language teacher? Do I need to pay first before the consultation? Yes. The first thing that happens when you sign up with us is you get a study plan consultation where you'll meet with the teacher one-on-one -on -one and talk about your previous scores, talk about your weaknesses, develop a bit of a pathway for you to study efficiently and effectively. Included in your packages are uh, things like tutorials and written feedback, as well as E2 Pronounce, lots of practice material, live mock tests every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. There's lots and lots to be gained. Han, my writing score was 90 in my previous attempt, but my vocab score was 77. How is it possible? The relationship between your enabling skills and your communicative skills is unclear. I do not know, and the PTE do not tell us how that relationship works. Because, yeah, as I said, I got 90 in reading, writing, listening, speaking. And I got 90 in all of my enabling skills, but for spelling, I got 68 for spelling, but I still got 90 in writing. I don't know. So, Son, you'll have to, if, you're, if you don't know how to use that, please email hello at e2language.com. Right, right, right. Okay, somebody's asked a good question. In one of the graphs that we looked at about tropical and temperate rainforests, there was nothing mentioned about deforestation. And I kept talking about deforestation. The reason is, is because 
I didn't know what that graph was about and it didn't tell me. And so I just made it up. I just created that. And that's fine. If you're looking at a particular graph on test day and it's not giving you enough information as to what it's about, feel free to just say, okay, this is about deforestation, <clears throat> whatever. That's fine. So fake it till you make it, earn it till you learn it. Maybe it's a bit of both. Maybe it's a bit of both. Okay, here's a great question. Um, Honey Yeah says, is it okay if we start all of our descriptions with the same introductory sentence? Like this graph represents the title plus the x-axis. This graph represents the title plus the x-axis. Yes, it's fine. I did it, got 90. Kaya did it, got 90. Uh, lots of our students have used this method effectively and got not necessarily 90, but certainly the scores they wanted. Is it a magic formula? No, because if you don't have grammar and vocabulary, it's not about strategy. If you have grammar and vocabulary and you have a good command of English, then strategy and methods are really important and they can help you to get that score. But if you just don't have those fundamental skills, it doesn't matter how much strategy and tips, it's got nothing to do with that. You need to build your foundational grammar, vocabulary, pronunciation. That's what language is. Okay, no, it will not impact vocabulary again and again. You can use this because really you're using a bit of a framework, but nothing is memorized except for this graph represents, this graph represents, this line graph represents. The rest of it is completely spontaneous language use. Um, will the image stay on the screen so that we can see it? And yes, 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 that's right. The, for 40, for 25 seconds preparation, it's there. And then for the 40 seconds description, it's there. So you're looking at it the whole time. If you have any questions about which package you might want to sign up to, or if you, you can go to email hello at e2language.com. All right, just checking YouTube, man. What have we got? 150 people. There's got th just just below 300 people watching this. Uh, okay, somebody's spamming in YouTube. Okay, so Anil Palm on YouTube asks, with maps, if he doesn't know the country's name, and let's say it's 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 it, let's say it's uh. Indonesia and West Papua, and let's say he makes a mistake and says that West Papua is Indonesia, is, will he lose marks? Not necessarily. I don't think so. I don't think it, it looks for content and the, that you're describing the image, but I don't think it really pays attention to the precise details of what you're saying. So take that pressure off yourself. <clears throat> you can make mistakes with the content. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Okay, people are asking about the mock tests at E2 Language because they're in different time zones. That's fine. If you miss it, it's at 7.30 p.m. Melbourne, Sydney time. If you miss it, you can watch it again on the website. Uh, okay. Okay, here's a question from Marielle. Can you write on your monitor when preparing in the 25 seconds? 25 seconds is so quick. The only time you have is just to quickly rehearse the introduction and think about what the key features are. That's it. That's all you don't write anything down in the 25 seconds. It goes like that. You just look at that image, focus on it, clear your mind. This graph represents the title plus the x axis. Okay, I'm going to do the Three top features there. Okay, and then I'm going to do Peru, Colombia. Then, okay, go. This graph represents blah, 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 blah. That's how you do it. It's, it's, uh, it's tough. It's really tough. Anyway, I'm exhausted. I'm going to leave you to it. Thanks very much for coming. I appreciate it. I hope it was helpful. If you need help, check out the website. Otherwise, keep practicing. Get there. I'm sure you'll get the mark you need and do whatever you want to do with your life. Good stuff. Thanks for coming along.